Brian from Multiversity Comics here, talking to Mr. Matt Kintz. Hello. How's it going? Good, good. Now, you have a lot going on right now. Uh, you're writing a ton of books. You're illustrating my management monthly. Let's start there. Uh, where did the initial idea for that series come about, and what is it about the espionage world that interests you? Because it's something you've worked with you know, throughout your career. Yeah, I, uh, well, honestly, the idea um, came from the title. I had the title first, Mind Management, and then I thought, well, those are good words together. What could that be? Uh, and actually just uh, it's the only book I've ever done where the, I had a title first and then got an ideas for the story from it you know and, and uh, I wish it was always that easy you know usually like I write a whole book and I'm like what should it be called what should it be called and uh, I know Super Spy was one of those books where that was my working title the whole way through Super Spy is a joke you know I'm like Super Spy that'll be funny like I don't know what to call it and then when I was done I'm like it's Super Spy it's like, Super Spy yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, so, um, yeah, that's where the idea c came from. And uh, as far as espionage goes, I've been asked it a few times, and I honestly, I never really was conscious of making a, other than Super Spy being, you know, like, oh, I want to tell spy stories. I never was really conscious of why, you know, and then as I've thought about it over the years, I'm like, I think it's just because it's sort of, it's sort of like the real world version of an alter ego, you know, like with superheroes, which I grew up reading, I'm like, oh, I love superheroes. And then as I got older, I'm like, I'm bored of superheroes. Um, but then I always thought, well, spies are sort of the same thing in real life where, you know, you have this life where you're like, this fake life that you're projecting, but you're really like this, you know, the superhero version is the spy version where you're trying to get information or do something like some secret mission or something, you know? So in a way, I, I feel like I like that idea of, of sort of the duplicity of, of a character. Uh, how is it different uh, treating my management as a monthly book versus some of your other works come out, you know, in a completed form? Do you find it liberating to be able to change things as you go, or is that more of a challenge as you can't plot it out exactly from A to B in the same way? Yeah, it's fun. Like it is fun because I can I can adjust things on the go and on the fly, and if I come up with an idea, I can implement it, you know, and it's not too late. Um, the flip side of that is it's like walking on a tight a tight rope. You know, with no net, well, like I can't mess up. So like anything that's happened and it's in print, that's it. You know, like we're with a graphic novel, I can finish the whole thing, which I, my process is do the whole thing, go back through and then revise and add and layer and put things in, take things out. But I don't have that, I can't do that with this. So like when that issue goes to press, it has to be right, you know? And so there's a little more danger there as far as like making sure it's, it is what it needs to be, you know? And then making sure I'm consistent going forward. So every time I start a new arc, I have the whole thing outlined, I have the whole series outlined, and each story arc is outlined as well, but I still have to go back through and read the whole series from beginning to where I ended to make sure that I didn't add something and then forget about it or you know change something and then, and then and make sure it all still works. So it's a little more difficult, I think. You say you have the whole series sort of uh, mapped out. How long do you foresee the series going? Um, 36 issues is what I told Dark Horse. And there's been an issue zero, which is like bonus stories that they did with Dark Horse Presents, mm -hmm. and they collected those. So there'll probably be a few more of those. I did another eight pager that's going to be in Dark Horse Presents in December, okay. which isn't, I didn't have a plan for that, you know, when I started. But um, then along the way, I do get ideas for like little short stories, and they have that venue that I can put it in. So I'll probably do a few more of those. And so there'll probably be some bonus issues sprinkled in here or okay. there, you know. And, and, uh, and issue 17 is going to have eight extra pages, you know, because I was, I really wanted to do something special and weird with that issue, <laughs> so, so there's going to be, it'll be bigger probably than 36, but mm -hmm. generally 36. Yeah, I know the single issue floppies have bonus material in them that you are not collecting in the regular trades. Uh, why was it important for you to have something different and exclusive for the people who are buying the book monthly? Yeah, I just feel like I want to reward the people that go into their shop every month and support their shop and then support the book, you know, it's those monthly sales that help me able to make this a viable career, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, if people wait for the book, that's six months or a year, and then, and then, but I have to live somehow between then and now. It's, things are great, the, the, the great thing about it is people are buying the monthlies, people are buying the regular book, and then it's both good at this point, like the series is secure, I, I'm making a decent enough living, you know, I don't have to worry about it, and uh, but I did want to sort of reward that monthly reader who, you know, goes in every month and um, and have something in there that wasn't just like sketchbook pages or a script page or like the normal bonus stuff. I wanted like some actual content. So, and then part of it was 
the challenge of just coming up with a fun one-page story every month that can go in there. Mm -hmm. Switching gears a little bit, you're starting Unity next month uh, for Valiant with Doug Braithwaite um, illustrating it. How is it for you as an artist to script for somebody else? Is it a liberating process? Do you find you're giving him things that you wouldn't do yourself or, or, or putting him in situations maybe you aren't comfortable with? Or do you find that you're writing things that you could see yourself illustrating? Yeah, I think um, the, the answer is like both of those things. You know, on one hand, like my storytelling I think visually, you know, when I tell a story, so I thumbnail out every story I script. Uh, I don't show the artist my thumbnails. I do that for me, so I know that how it's going to be paced and how the storytelling is going to work, you know. Um, and then I write a script for the the artist, in this case, Doug, and then I turn it in. And, it, and it's different every time. Like I've worked with a bunch of different artists at this point, and so the process is always a little different. Sometimes the art comes back and it looks exactly like I scripted, and I'm like, oh, that's great. Sometimes it's there's changes or they've rearranged things or done something or added something and I'm like that's cool too you know like as long as it as long as the story works you know I don't really I'm not super picky about like this is what I wrote it needs to be like that you know part of the fun of doing that is like writing it with my idea in my head but then seeing like how that my written words translate through that artist you know and every artist is different so they have a different filter and a different thing they bring to it and, and uh yeah, and especially with Doug, I told I, saw, I met him yesterday for the first time. We'd only corresponded through email, and I was, and uh, he would turn the pages, and I'm like, they look freaking awesome. Yeah. Like, that guy is so good. Like, um, but yeah, I was like, he. I would write scenes, you know, and I have certain ways I do layouts, and his, his layout system is completely different. And it comes back, I'm like, dang, these characters look awesome. Like, they're so cool. And uh, like the in the Unity, the first issue, there's like this whole other team that's not the main characters that I sort of describe and everything, but I was like, I don't know how he's gonna draw them. And then when you see him the first time, it's like, they're so cool. Like, somebody gets killed in that issue, it's like, I regretted having them die because I'm like, that's too bad, because he looks so cool. <laughs> so for those who don't know about the story at all, just give us the basic, you know, elevator pitch for Unity. Yeah, well, Unity basically is um, all of the major characters of the Valiant Universe, Exo, Ninjak, Livewire, Harada, Eternal Warrior, who all have their own books, except Ninjak and Livewire. But basically, those main characters and throwing them together in sort of like a Justice League type situation, except I'm trying to do a more real world take on that. You know, like if you threw all those characters together in real life, they're not going to get along, you know, and they're not going to be a good team. Like, they honestly, like you look at a football team and they have, uh, and I compare it to sports in a way because it is like you get all these different personalities and, peop and egos and different things trying to get those people to move together in unison and towards a common goal is, takes practice, you know? So like in issue one, you can't just throw all these guys together and expect oh, they're gonna beat some big like space parasite or something, you know? That's not gonna happen. They're gonna, it's gonna be a mess, you know? And they're gonna screw up and they're gonna hate each other. And, and uh, so to me, that's kind of the fun of that is sort of treating it like, like what would happen, for, you know, if you really put the, yeah. this team together. Uh, you and Doug also just recently did the Sinestro Villains Month issue. Was that the first time you worked together? Or did that happen before Unity, or was that happening sort of concurrently with Unity? Um, I don't think Doug's drawing. He didn't draw Sinestro. Did he, do, did he do some of the Sinestro stuff? He was he was solicited as the artist. Was he? Yeah, no, he didn't end up doing that. Oh. <laughs> but it, My yeah, apologies. No, Doug's great. Well, uh, when I found out Doug was doing it, Warren, the editor, told me, he's like, don't tell me about it. I think we got Doug to do it. And I was like, that's awesome. And I went back and looked at all my old stuff. I'm like, what do I have of Doug's? You know, I had like mm -hmm. Justice and everything and then the, some of the Earth, it wasn't Earth X, was it Universe X? Once something, I can't remember. <laughs> but I had all those, that stuff and I went back and looked at it as like inspiration for like how to write it too because I think like I, I do try to write to an artist's strengths, mm -hmm. you know, and then um, and just to see how he lays things out and try to like make sure I'm writing something that he's going to be able to like hit out of the park, mm -hmm. you know, and it, he totally did. Yeah. Uh, as somebody who has a lot of experience writing your own work, illustrating your own work, sort of being the own your own the captain on your own ship here, is it a tough transition to work for a company like DC or Marvel that is much more editorial driven? That has uh, just you know they own the characters and they have a certain vision for it. Is it tough to fall in line and work within that, or was it kind of a natural fit for you? Yeah, you know it's different. I I compare it to like day jobs I've had. Like I used to be a graphic designer and I worked in an office and there's like the hierarchy of approval and everything. So 
I know what that is and, and what it's about. And as long as you go in with your eyes open and know that that's going to be there, everything's good, you know. And, and uh, it's just a little bit more time consuming because so many more eyes have to see it and approvals have to be done. And, and I think that gets, it can get annoying, you know, like if you're not used to it or you haven't seen it before. And, uh, and it is, it's just part of the, it's the trade-off, you know. It's right. like if you want to write Superman, well, you're going to have to, it's a little bit more than you just going and writing and then turning it in and you're done, you know. Right. It's, it's different, you know. It is, yeah. it is a trade-off that you have to make. Yeah. Uh, you recently released Red Handed, which was a, a, an amazing book. We really loved it at Multiversity. Um, when you're doing an outside book like that, something that isn't my management, that isn't uh, company-driven work, does that tend to get pushed to the side and that's what you do? You know, when you have a free minute here or there, how do you find time to, with all that you're doing monthly, how do you find time to put together those other books? Yeah, you don't. <laughs> the short answer is you don't. I finished Red Handed right before I started my management, you know, so that was right. I finished that book and went right to my management number one, you know, and they were, Dark Horse was waiting for it. So I was like, okay, I can't. There's no break. Usually I take a break between books of like, like three or four weeks just to recharge my batteries. And I was like, they needed it to go start, you know, I was like, okay, well, let's do it. And, uh, and so I, I can't work on, I can't draw two books simultaneously, you know. So I definitely finished that before I started my management, and uh, just because the art is so labor intensive, mm -hmm. it just takes too much out of me. Where, like writing, you know, I can I can write one book one day, one book the next day, and it's different than having to be stuck at a table all day drawing, and like scanning and coloring. So it's it's hard to do two art pieces at once. So unfortunately, does that mean we're not going to see another book until after my management's done? Yeah, probably not. Yeah, I just, honestly, I did. I had, I, uh, I have a couple, I have a book for Top Shelf, the sequel to Super Spy, which is, is like basically penciled, waiting for me to get to, you know, and mm -hmm. I just, I can't get my mind, I can't wrap my mind around it right now. <laughs> so. And just real quickly touching on your DC and Marvel work, um, you're working on Spider-Man right now. Mm -hmm. You've also been working with a ton of DC characters. Um, you said you grew up reading comics. What's it like to be able to come into those characters you grew up reading and sort of be able to uh, play in that universe for a little while? What's been the most rewarding part of that for you? Yeah, I think uh, I think just writing like Peter Parker's dialogue and like his inner mo inner dialogue, you know, is like the best part. Where I don't even have to think about him. Like I just know like that character. I know him, and uh, it's fun. I will say like I told my wife, I was like I've been so busy this summer that uh, I'm just. I'm like relieved when I've turned it in and it's and it, I think it's good, you know, and I'm like happy with it. But I'm so busy that I have to just go to the next thing. I haven't had time to like, hey, I just wrote, sp I wrote five issues of Spider-Man. You know, I don't have time to reflect on it. Like, so I, I think I took on a little too much in that way where I'm not, I don't get like a couple of days of just enjoying having written Spider-Man. It's because I'm writing like the next thing. So, <laughs> so next year, that's my vow is to start enjoying it. Good luck with that. Thank you very much for your time. No problem.